Welcome to the Psychology of Cult TV panel. Um, this is an annual review. Uh, I'm your moderator. My name is Dustin McGinnis. I am a musician and a podcaster. I do a wonderful podcast with Dr. Janina Scarlett over there. Um, what? You don't mind. <laughs> um, we're all super excited to have you here today. Um, we have an amazing panel, as you can see. And uh, first and foremost, are there any Supernatural fans out there? How about Game of Thrones? Did you guys catch up on Stranger Things? You feel that? That's why we're here. Our love for these shows and how they bring us together. Um, so, like I mentioned, we have some amazing professionals here. And what I'd like to do is ask the panelists to introduce yourselves and let us know what you're working on and how people can find you on social media. Starting with you, Rachel. Well, um, I'm Rachel Miner. I was on Supernatural. Uh, I'm most proud of being the executive director of Random Max. Uh, RandomX.org. Uh, look us up. And uh, you can find me on Twitter, Rachel Miner. One, I think? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Rachel Miner's Gram. Yes, that's right. I'm gonna I stalk you. <laughs> I'm Ruth Connell. I'm currently... Uh, it's like coming home, coming to Comic Con. I came here on my own dollar, so I'm gonna talk to myself. Uh, for the first time when I was first ever starting a Supernatural. Uh, so it's lovely to be here. Um, I'm still working on it. <laughs> I'm not dead yet. <laughs> I'm, I'm Ruthie Connell, Ruthie hyphen Connell, Ruthie under something like that. <laughs> In various places. Hi, I'm Jonathan Mayberry. I'm a novelist and comic book writer. I write for Marvel, IDW, and Dark Horse. And one of my comics, V Wars, is going to be a Netflix series in December starring Ian Summerholder. Um, and also actors, I mean, we've got actors from The Expanse, from The Hundred, from uh, Orphan Black, from pretty much every bit in Smallville, uh, Arrow. So it's going to be a, it's a fun show. And it's, what about Supernatural? <laughs> I, I, I think you guys are still busy, you know, um, but... I, I'm, I'm open. And, and we're, hopefully they're about to announce season two, so we'll be looking for people. And I just got named executive producer retroactively, which is weird. Yeah. Uh, um, but also I have uh, a bunch of uh, movies and TV in various stages of development with Alcon and Sony and other, other places, so... Uh, um, going from the book world into the, the TV and movie world. Kind of digging it. I'm Tamara Robertson. I um, am a chemical and biomolecular engineer. And you guys may know me from Mythbusters, Mythbusters Jr., Mythbusters The Star. Anything Mythbusters we've done in the last um, But what I'm proudest of is actually an outreach comic that I formed, Seekers of Science. It's at seekersofscience.com. Um, and you can find me at the real Tamara Robertson on Instagram. I'm so sorry that you have to figure out how to spell that. Um, and at tlinar85 on everything else. Hi guys, I am Dr. Janina Scarlett. I'm a clinical psychologist, author, and a full-time geek. And, <laughs> and I specialize in incorporating popular culture like television shows such as Supernatural and Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Arrow, uh, Game of Thrones and others into therapy to help survivors of post-traumatic stress disorder to heal and recover. Quite a lineup. Um, <laughs> I'm just a guy that just walked off the street. I'm like one of those wedding crashers, but I'm a panel crasher. So it looked like it was fun, so I just came up here to join. Now, hey everyone, what's up? Uh, my name is Derek Hughes. I'm a writer, producer. Uh, for such shows as Arrow, which currently are on uh, Flash. Actually, uh, Scream season three that just aired uh, two weeks ago, and uh, a little show called Warehouse 13 and Beauty and the Beast. Oh, and uh, at D Black and Beast. <laughs> Thank you. So, let's go ahead and get this started. Ruth and Rachel, this first question is for you two. Supernatural is one of the longest dark fantasy TV shows ever. Um, it just 
ended its 14th season, and sadly, it's about to end in the 15th season. How many of your hearts are breaking right now? <laughs> so, what I want to know is, in your opinion, what is it about this show in particular that we are so drawn to? There's two dudes. <laughs> really, really tall. <laughs> It's about family or something. No. I, uh, I'm being flippant. I actually cried this morning. Um, Jensen's up there um, directing an episode. It's her first day, and my first ever day of filming was an episode that Jensen directed. So I sent him an email, and I was like weeping. <laughs> so I sent him an email. And I do think that it is it's a show about family. We are one big dysfunctional family, aren't we, Rachel? And uh, I think people love the love of the two brothers and the fact that they love people who, and they make the people who um, they work with and come into contact with, they become their family. Because we can't all choose our families, but we can choose our heart families. That's why I think so. Anyway. There's, there's uh, two factors that I think draw a lot of people in. One is it is not just about family, but about supporting each other and really being loyal and really caring for each other uh, on a very deep level. And the, it's not just that that's in the writing of the show, that's in a lot of the people who are part of the making of the show. And I feel like that comes across. So we're all kind of drawn, there's something that just feels really abnormally nice and good and right about that. And I think that that's also the humans behind the scenes and uh, the humans making the show. Um, and then also, um, I really, I, I think that I love that we all live in the grays on that show. So every character is not good or bad or black or white. It's we're somewhere in between and we're trying to figure out on a daily basis. And we mess up and we learn. Um, and I think that that is very fundamentally true. Very much yeah. Yeah. So I actually have a follow-up question for you two. Um, in addition to having a huge fan following for its like on-screen episodes, uh, Supernatural also has a huge following for its off-screen stuff like your uh, conventions. Can you please talk about how such fan experiences might be meaningful to the fans? I mean, it's meaningful to, to us. I mean, it's meaningful to, to, to be there. Um, they are, we've got some of the people we work with. Stand up girls, stand up ladies. We're, <laughs> we're, we are such a family, they've come along today. Well, I need to check them. They're coming as red as your hair. <laughs> Victoria is purple. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, the, uh, we do these meet and greets, we do photo ops, autographs, all the different things, but um, after Jared spoke about, about um, and started to always keep fighting, hashtag or movement. Um, we now have um, trained um, therapists at the conventions because so many people were bringing, um, because he spoke out, so many people felt able to, to speak up about the difficulties they were going through. And so we actually have professionals there now to, to counsel people. Um, and so there's a sort of healing aspect um, that's come into play in the conventions as well, as well as, as all the charitable and um, fundraising stuff that's come about twos, yeah. which is I, where Rachel comes in. Yeah. Well, no, but I also, I think there's like a general ethos and a general agreement amongst all the performers as well, is there's not a big differentiation of like, oh, you're a fan of the show, therefore you're, le le no, we all care and uh, we all care about each other and we're all happy to connect to each other. And so there's not any kind of looking down on, it's just trying to build community. And I think that that comes across. Um, and the truth is, um, especially for the three lead actors, most people that get to that level of success stop doing conventions. Um, and they've made it a an absolute that they still go to all those. And so it helps to keep a consistency within that community. And I think we all feel that. And it becomes really important to all of us. Um, and then there is the charitable element that, like, we're always trying to build community. Um, and then there's the gish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, we're all, a random ass. 
too. Yeah, I, and I can't take credit for this. Someone else can. But, um, but, but in any event, it's all of these things are constantly throughout the year uh, doubling down on that sense of community and the fact that we can be better than, I think, the average fandom. <laughs> well, I love it. Um, we're going to move over to another fandom and talk to you, Derek, at the end. Um, you've worked on some of the most iconic shows in television, um, including The Flash and Arrow, um, and both of these shows really speak to a lot of us fans in terms of how it, the portrayals uh, you, you show of overcoming severe traumas and traumatic incidences. Um, what are you hoping that viewers are able to take away from these shows, and what is your creative process like? Uh, what do they take away from it? That there's shows? Uh, you know, um, because I think that, you know, even though you write what you know, I, I've never had the traumatic experience of Barry Allen, of losing a parent in such a horrible, gruesome way. Uh, I mean, that's not to be, that I haven't thought about it when I was a kid, but that's a whole other story that we'll get into another day. Um, but, you know, uh, it's, I think that, you know, the thing is that we start with, and this is, a, you know, all credited to Greg Berlanti, and in the way of, of heart humor spectacle, right? And the thing is what drives, that's the engine of the show. And so we start with the heart of like, where are these characters, the emotional journey of these characters? Because without that, nothing matters, right? You're just watching just pretty people on television talking. And, and you really don't care, but you want to care about these characters, and that is what we have to strive for first and foremost. So I think in the process of that, that's, you know, every, every character that is on the screen is like, we start with like, what is their emotional arc? And then first and foremost, and then, you know, the humor and spectacle come second. But you, you cannot have a functioning story or show without that. So, uh, you know, in, in, in the thing that I think that we want character, I mean, you know, fans to be able to relate to and understand and, and sympathize and, and be, you know, frustrated and, you know, it's like all, it basically, you know, evoke emotions and people get invested. But there's, I was just talking to my friend about this, is there's, you know, the responsibility and, and, you know, being, trying to be conscious of, of not just pulling on heartstrings for the sake of pulling on heartstrings. Like there has to be a reason why that you're, you're creating a moment, you know, not just for like, well, this should get the audience's attention, you know, it's, it's more about, it has to serve as a story, so, I don't know if that answered the question. <laughs> well, how much of your personal experiences as writers go into the, these stories you build in, with these characters? Well, okay, I don't know how many people watched Arrow last season when Oliver Queen went to prison. Well, I too went to prison just so I can act, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, that's the thing. It's like it's create it's creativity. You know, it's like again, none of us. I don't think any of us went to jail to say like, what is it going to take for Oliver Queen to you know, how's he going to cope with this? But there is, you put yourself in the, in those shoes, and there are other people that have those experiences that you can mine from and understand. And and you know, this the psychology of Oliver Queen, especially there was a, a episode called Level Two, where he's actually talking to a doctor who's getting in his head, but he's getting in his head for all the wrong reasons. Uh, and, and, you know, there, there, there are things that we get to play with in that way, but I don't know, it's just, there, yeah, while there are some personal experiences that you can pour into it, I don't know if we can actually pour into the, I've never been to the Speed Force, you know, contrary to popular belief, just want to let people know, <laughs> much as I'd love to, I've never been there, so, um, but there are other, other writers, I think, that, you know, they all bring their other personal experiences and pour it in there, but not without it being about them. That's never the purpose of anything of, that we write or create. It's not about us. It's about the character, servicing the character. You have to remember that. Right. So uh, this question is for the entire panel. What have been, well, or what is one of your favorite TV shows and a moment that might have moved you or inspired you in a TV show? Actually, I got one. There's, there's, every once in a while, you'll have a show that so deeply surprises you by its insight into characters. Um, I, I love the show Scrubs. Yeah. Uh, there, there was an episode where uh, Brendan Fraser's character was brought back, and he's dying of cancer, and he's talking to Dr. Cox, who was his best friend, and talking to JD, and um, you know about he's just laughing off this whole idea of, of cancer, uh, and uh, Dr. Cox is getting really tied up with him as they get ready for. 
the, the christening for, for the doctor's kid. And as, as the show progresses toward the christening, you know, they're all walking together in the, in, in the cemetery, the three of them, uh, Brendan Fraser, Dr. Cox, and J.D. And J.D., you know, finally, he turns weirdly to Dr. Cox and says, where do you think you are? And the camera pans, and Brendan Fraser's not there. We're at his funeral, his character's funeral. It's a comedy show that just swung in that direction where a character was so dis uh, dysfunctional that he was no longer able to live in the reality of his best friend dying. And he constructed something so elaborate that it drew in other people. Um, and he, he perceived everyone else being in the same place in his illusion that he was. It was such a powerful, heartbreaking, and beautiful moment. Mm -hmm. It was, I think, one of the finest scripted scenes in television I've ever seen. I got chills just remembering it when you're Yeah, uh, I just watched it not that long ago, and it's like, oh my god. They, it, I don't know if it would have worked as well in a drama. It was a dramatic show. The fact that it was a goofy comedy show made that punch so deep. Hit so deep. Um, that, that's the sort of thing that I look for, you know, as, as a writer who also loves television, when I see good writing, it's usually when someone, when the writers have, have had the courage to go there. Because sometimes, you know, like, sometimes writers play it safe. You, you, you know, you were talking about uh, writers not necessarily writing for experience, but they still have to write with integrity for the characters. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, it shows. It shows when you're pandering to the audience. And good writing doesn't pander. Good writing invites the audience to not only, you know, uh, enjoy it, but to participate in the process of telling that story. They're all, we're all co-conspirators in if there's good writing. And um, that show, that episode of Scrubs, I think, is the one that, that most solidly hits that note for me. Was that Tom Cavanaugh? Who was, no, the, who was the guy? Brendan Fraser. Brendan Fraser. Brandon Fraser. Who Wasn't was there another one with Tom Cavanaugh? Tom Cavanaugh played Jamie's brother, who was a... Uh, Did he also die? I don't know. I don't think he died. But <laughs> it was, yeah. oh, oh, okay. Okay. Yes, thank you. <laughs> See, we overlap. <laughs> Any other? Um, do you guys remember in Supernatural, I think it was season six, Death's Door? I know. I was, uh, I made the mistake of watching it in the middle of the night while my husband was asleep. And he woke up and watched me sob uncontrollably. And he said, who died? <laughs> Bobby. Um, but uh, the reason why that episode really spoke to me is because not only did Bobby get to re-experience his worst trauma and go back, but he got to see that little boy himself who was being traumatized and abused, and he got to comfort that child. And, um, you know, being a refugee, having escaped a world of violence, being able to have this kind of a mi mental time machine to go back and comfort our youngest child is one of the most therapeutic and powerful experiences that we can have. And watching that episode allowed me to do that. It allowed me to go back to that child that was being, um, being abused and victimized and offer her the same kind of support and compassion that Bobby received. And it's so interesting how these seemingly simple television shows can have these monumental effects on us as viewers and on so many people out there. Yeah. Um, I have trouble with favorites. Yeah, thank you. Um, no, I have trouble with favorites, so, because uh, I know I'll, I'll think of something later and wish I'd said that instead. But I tend to like a genre show, so, and I like out there concepts because I feel like we can get closer to truth and the truth that exists in reality by looking outside from a different perspective. So, like some of the things I've, I love, Good Omens and The OA and Sense Eight and Legend of Korra and like I'm trying to, but also recently I've been watching Years and Years. I don't know if anyone's seen that. BBC, Ooh. HBO, yeah. And I've been so moved, and it's one of the few times where I've seen a show that can be dealing with basically reality, um, slightly altered, you know, into the future, but, um, and deal with it on such a deep level that it still hits home. And they, they're talking about the, the refugee crisis, the last episode, I don't know if you saw, but you, like, it took me a while to recover and I cried a lot. 
lot, but it was really important, really good, and it's got some of the best representation I've ever seen. Uh, there is a character in a wheelchair, and she actually, first they didn't address it even for the first episode, like for a while, and then it just is. And you, know, you see it more through the lens of other people having an awkward time and not knowing what questions to ask her and things like that, but it's, she's got spina bifida and it's just something she's lived with her whole life and she doesn't give people room to make it awkward. Um, and it's so exciting, she goes on dates and she has sex and she's like there, it's something I've never seen before. Um, and she, again, it's like she's just a character that doesn't leave room for not to be included and not to be a part of the world. And it's really exciting to see. So. I love that. And, and that's the thing. That's the thing about television shows and well-written television shows is that they, they don't allow us to turn a blind eye on things that are happening. Right? I think that so often throughout the day, there's so many negative things going on in the world that we may not have the emotional capacity to deal. And so we might turn to an escape, right? So we might turn to maybe a television show only to find that it actually portrays the very thing that we were running from, but maybe in a way that makes it easier to understand and also easier to understand for us that we're not alone in being overwhelmed by this experience and understand how to process this experience, understanding that, that there are terrible things going on in the world and people are suffering and also that even one person can make a difference, that even one person can, can take a step and say, no more, and it stops with me. We're seeing that in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., we're seeing that in Supernatural, we're seeing that in Era. we're seeing that in every well-written television show, but it depicts real life in so many ways, and I think that's why we're so drawn to these shows. Uh, but The Handmaid's Tale, for me, has felt like some of the most important television I've ever seen. Um, the first season in particular, I, I thought I, I thought it was I thought I was coming to something that, that maybe nobody else was realizing. Where at some one point during the season, I thought everything that's happening to these women has happened, and then I read it. Of course, that's what Margaret wrote so brilliantly wrote you know, all those decades ago, um, and it's it's interesting to see the, the the lead character and some of for me some of the flashback stuff and some of the judgments that I might have had on her as a mother. And just, I feel like my perception is shifting in the right here and now about our normal. Mm -hmm. our, uh, yeah, and, and realizing my own um, bigotry towards my own uh, gender. <laughs> and some of the self-imposed rules and, uh, that, that I've had on myself. So for me, it's been honestly life-changing to see that, that show. I'm sorry. Uh, from something that isn't yet aired, um, the show that I have coming up, uh, we had a, uh, the story deals with, with racism. It's about, you know, a gene that fires and a percentage of the population becomes vampires and suddenly it's us versus them. So it, it, it drills down into what's going on with, with everything from immigration to, um, to race bias and everything else. Um, and there, there was an episode that, that was scripted and um, Ian, our our star and also was one of the producers and director, we wrote the episode. And he, he and I had a nice long talk about it at, uh, at Emerald City Comic Con. Ian's a good, really good guy and he runs really, really deep. I mean, a lot, so if, if you don't know who he is, you think he's the pretty guy from, uh, from Lost and, and Vampire Diaries, but he's a really complex guy. And he wanted to drill deeper and deeper and deeper into the issues of racism and intolerance and what that means in, in Modern America, that you know, this is 20, 2019, and, and we're you know, racism is running away, and, and sexism is running away, and all these other elements that my year, the hippie year, thought we had conquered, <laughs> not so much. And you know, Ian's quite a bit younger than I am, and, but he went in there with a sensibility of having a foot in, you know, uh, kind of the past a little bit. He's you know, a bit of a student of history, and also as a father of the, of the daughter, and. Um, looking at what the world's going to be like with her. He went in and wrote that in a way that's going to draw blood. Um, you know, he could have, it, it could have been careful and it was originally scripted as careful. You know, it's like, we're going to go up to the edge of racism, we're going to pull back. And he's like, you know, hell with that. And he, he pulled out knives on it. So 
Um, that's the sort of thing where I can't wait to look an episode of my own show because of, of the way people who are working on it decided that it can't just be this, it's got to go deeper, it's not worth doing. And I would say, um, for me, some I, I grew up obviously as a, a Trekkie and, and loving the sci-fi tech side of it, so it led me to engineering. So some of my favorite shows right now are um, actually Black Mirror and Altered Carbon. And the main reasons that I love these shows is because they ask the question of where we're going next. Um, and they bring up the issues when it comes to privacy and rights and how you know we could very quickly jump from being a society that's sharing all of our best favorite spoiler reel, reel, reels of our life and suddenly be owned by them and suddenly be judged in a way that we've never even realized we can be judged. Um, and so it's one of those things that I love that they push it all the way to the darkest realm it can go but they never resolve it. Because at the end of the day, we don't know what the answer is because we don't know how bad it could potentially get or how good it could potentially be. And I think especially um, as a nation where we're pushing STEM so hard, we need to also be pushing the ethics of technology and science and what we're looking at because you know, we don't know to ask those questions until we see the possible nightmare that they could be. So luckily those writers are showing that potential dark side and I just love watching each episode as it comes out because each one's standalone and it's a totally different tech that they're looking at. And I don't know if you guys watch the series, but the, the one on AR and VR, I spent like two weeks trying to figure out if I was real. And I'm like, is Elon right? Am I, is, this, is that room glitching right now? Is this, is this actually reality? So I, I like that it even makes me question as someone so deeply involved in tech. Well, I mean, you mentioned Star Trek and um, I just wrote a thought down here. Um, there's shows like Firefly and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Orville, and they create this magic through science, and it's like you. And um, what I want to say is, y you inspire kids and adults of all genders to pursue their passions for building and science. What is it like to create these kinds of incredible projects? And in your experience, how does it affect these kids? in their backgrounds. Yeah, so it's really interesting. So I spent um, a little under a decade in corporate engineering, um, kind of chipping away at that glass ceiling and setting up women in leadership programs. And so when I came out full time to do um, outreach was about the time that the Mythbusters franchise found me. And there's actually, there's clips of me going, you know, I'm doing this for the girls in STEM. I'm showing them that we're, we can be equal, we can, we can push and we can do anything a man can do, if not better than in high heels. Um, and so it was one of those things that I, I was adamant that I was doing this for the girls, I was doing this for the girls. But it was actually the parents that came to me and started talking to me how, about how it was affecting their sons about seeing a woman on television that not only was there as an engineer and a scientist, but also was able to run all of the same equipment that the guys could do, could lift all of the things that they could do. It started to kind of change that perception, and I realized that what I was doing was bigger than I thought it could be. Um, and then it came into, you know, I'm a Southern girl, right? So I, I love chivalry. I think it's fine to open my doors. But trying to teach the men that worked around me that there's no ego, like I know my limitations, but don't tell me where they are. Um, I, when I need the help, I will definitely ask for it. And it was something that I realized that, you know, it's never meant to be um, someone holding me back. Um, I know we like to say a lot that men are holding women back, but in reality, most of the chances I've been given in the world have been because men that have daughters wanna see the world change. Um, or men that have wives that they love and respect and see them in the shop with them. They want to see more women realize that they can do that. Um, and so it's something that I go into these young girls' camps now and I tell them, you know, the trope of catfighting women is alive and well in science. And every little girl has the mission to change that. Because men get to the top and they turn around and, and they do what we should do as women when we get to the top. They find someone like them that inspires them and they help to lift them up and they help to show them the way. Most of the women managers that I've had didn't do that. If anything, they were like, this is my spot, I'm keeping this spot. Um, Chuck Palahniuk actually in an interview with Joe Rogan said it really well. Um, when he first won an award, he started doing um, workshops to be able to teach other writers. And they asked him, why are, you, why are you setting up competition? And he said, I'm not, I'm developing a market. 
So we as women like learning that and, and lifting each other up. So when I got the chance to, to do Mythbusters Junior this summer, my goal was to make sure, last summer was to make sure that all three girls left knowing how to weld and that they supported each other every day on that set because it was so quick that they, you know, that they could have gone the other way. And instead, all six of the kids lifted each other up and really thrived together. So, and just went to no, that's good. And I remember well, one of a uh, panel I did maybe three years ago or something. They asked me ahead of time if I was okay with being on the panel with a, this other actress because they thought somehow we must hate each other because we're both women. It was really absurd. Um, and now that's not even a question ever. So, yeah. It's important. <laughs> um, Dr. Scarlett, this question is for you. Why is it that shows like Stranger Things and Game of Thrones, Winona Earp, Jessica Jones, and many others affect fans the way they do, and in terms of making fans, like, affecting their anger, their hope, and getting them excited. I, I like to think of fiction as reality told through a fantasy. It's, it's a reality that we often don't talk about, right? And unfortunately, many of us have been raised to believe that we don't talk about the bad things that we have experienced. We don't talk about the trauma. We don't talk about the nightmares. We don't talk about the pain. We just put on the mask, the I am fine mask, and move on with our day. But it doesn't work that way because monsters are out there. Um, there's internal monsters and there's external monsters. And the more we talk about them, the more we can see that monsters can actually be defeated. And so in watching things like Stranger Things, we know that there are these monsters that maybe we can't see. Maybe they live in our walls, maybe they live in our hearts, maybe they, they haunt us from our past. And, and maybe it feels like they've kidnapped us and taken us to the upside down and, and, and we can't recover. Um, and it, is, it might take the help of all our friends and our entire family to pull us back from those monsters for us to feel like we can we can take another step and go another day. Um, I, at the end of Game of Thrones, I think there was a lot of um, a lot of separation in how the fans felt about it, right? So a lot of fans really loved it, a lot of fans really hated it. Um, so without getting into too much discussion of how people felt, um, I find that a lot of times we tend to draw certain connections with certain characters. Maybe it's a character that is giving us our own voice. Maybe it's a survivor that has been through something that we have been through. Maybe it's somebody that we see as a representation of us. And sometimes if that character takes a different direction on the screen than we might have taken, it might feel like a betrayal because we ourselves would not take that action and therefore we might expect that that character would act. Uh, a certain way. And I think that we as fans grow so attached to some of these television shows because they're not just shows to us. Because they, they might serve as a surrogate friend or a surrogate family member or a surrogate mythology in a way to allow us to understand our own experiences and to allow us to understand where to go next. Uh, what they tell us, what all of these stories in turn really tell us is that no matter how big and scary the monsters are, if we bond together, we can do the impossible. Is there a clinical example that you can discuss where you incorporate something like this? Sure. Um, so uh, I'm going to tell you about an example of Doctor Who. Are you guys familiar with Doctor Who? <laughs> so um, I was working with uh, a client who had been through trauma so severe that he developed not only PTSD but also agoraphobia, which for a lot of people means fear of leaving the house or fear of leaving safe, sp uh, safe spaces or being in open spaces. So for him, his fear was so overwhelming that he couldn't even leave his room. So the first day when um, I did a house visit, we did an entire session. Um, I was on one side of the door and he was on the other. He couldn't even come out. We spent six months in uh, doing sessions in his living room, just um, talking, processing his trauma. And for this particular individual, he, had, he was a big Doctor Who fan. 
despite the fact that he was a big Doctor Who fan, he had a really difficult time leaving the house, which meant that he was missing his son's um, school practices, he was missing his friends' um, birthdays, and he was um, not engaging in the kind of meaningful life that he, um, that he wanted. As we continued processing his trauma, we, we looked to the doctor and I asked him, what is it that he likes about the doctor? And he said that no matter what happens to the doctor, the doctor shows up. The doctor shows up where it really matters, even when he's scared. And, and he might show up on this planet or on another planet or at this time point or another time point, and that's what he wanted to do. And he said that as a small child, he and his family actually used to um, travel and help people. And after um, the trauma that he experienced, he could not leave his house and therefore couldn't travel, couldn't do the kind of family missions that he wanted to do to help um, people who had been survivors of awful experiences. So we talked about him stepping outside of the house as stepping out of the TARDIS, as kind of just taking a step, not just fighting the aliens, but just stepping outside. And I'll never forget this moment where we stepped outside and we're kind of holding hands, and he was holding my hand with one hand and another hand he was holding onto his, the wall of the house. He was kind of shaking for a while. And then we just kind of stood there, just him kind of still being near the TARDIS in a way. Um, and then I asked him to just tell me the colors of the cars that were passing by. So he would say things like red or black or blue. And after a while he stood up and he said, I can do this. And a few months later, he drove to my office. We actually had a session in my office. And six months after that, he started traveling again. He's now traveling to third world countries, and because his life mission is to be like the doctor, to travel to different kinds of countries, to help people affected by war, by famine, by violence. And this is what he does now. He still gets anxious. He still gets panic attacks when he travels too far. But he says being the real life doctor is worth it. That's beautiful. And that leads perfectly into my next question. But I, I want to see if, uh, by raise of hands, how many of you would like to ask a question. And maybe we can have you line up to the mic right there in the middle. And then. <laughs> <laughs> Is it all in the I'm, I'm going to ask one more question. I just wanted to get people ready. <laughs> if you want to. Um, so, we were talking about connections, and in this day and age, there's so much pain and struggle in the world going on. Sometimes the best thing we can do is connect with a TV show. Um, so, sometimes we go through life feeling as if we're alone, or as, as if no one can understand what we're going through personally. For anyone out there in the audience who might be struggling today, what are some kind words or some inspirations you might be able to offer them? I would say to reach out. Um, it's very easy to start feeling like you're the only one in the world and everything on you is too heavy to be able to get off of you or get past. Um, it's really easy in those moments to get engulfed by that darkness and to not realize that there is a light, there is a light out there. Um, I have a group of close friends that we literally, when days are getting too hard, where we can't remember why we're doing what we're doing or we can't lift ourselves up, we send a single light bulb and a text. And that person finds 30 minutes, no matter where they are, to call the other person and to listen to them vent and then to actually remind them of why they're doing what they're doing, why they love, where they're at and how to be able to lift themselves back up out of that darkness. And it is very hard, today's world is very dark, but remember that you can be that light. You can be that light for someone else, and if you can't find that light, that person does exist in your life. You just have to reach out. And I would say a reminder that you matter. Your story makes a difference. If you're feeling alone, if you're feeling overwhelmed, share your story. Chances are there is a billion other people who are going through the same thing and just by you reading, by, by reading about what you're going through if you post it, by, by understanding what you're experiencing, they also might feel less alone and more supported. And also I would like to add that you might not be aware of this, but chances are you've already helped numerous people in your life. You might not know this because a lot of times when you do something good, people might not tell you. 
but there are probably numerous people out there whose life is already better because of something kind that you did. Maybe you smiled at them, maybe you texted them, maybe you checked in with them, maybe it was a stranger you smiled at. Maybe there's somebody out there that's alive today because of you, because of something that you have already done, because you're already a superhero. I'd say probably one of the most important things for all of us is to let go the, of the illusion of perfect and the illusion of normal. Um, I feel like I was given a great gift because I have something exterior that shows, oh, she's not, like she doesn't have it all together, something's going on. Um, and people tend to be more honest with me because of that. And I started to realize, hey, wait, none of us has this figured out. We're all laboring under this illusion, though, that we have to pretend to each other that we're okay and we got this and, like, everything's fine. Um, and I think that's really dangerous. And I think if we're going to heal as individuals and as a society, we have to start being able to be open with each other and find ways we can support each other. And that's only going to start from a place of honesty. It's only going to start from a place of self-acceptance. Self and so, uh, so please start forgiving yourself for those quote imperfections. They are not imperfections and we all have strengths and weaknesses and uh, let's let go of that whole lie. So that's my I, uh, I come over 5,000 miles, you know, to be here, to get to this point in my life and I got this job on what has become the best job of my life at the age where you're told to kind of retire as an actress. And I, I'm Scottish and you just get told to get your head down and get on with it. We're not big into therapy like all the Californians and all that. <laughs> but what I, will, what I will admit to is that it takes licensed professionals to keep me on straight and narrow, to allow me to be the best version of myself so that I can turn up on set or to conventions and hold my shit together. And I'm proud of it. I'm proud that I've had help. And I just, if anybody has the remotest sense that they might need any help, you can just mention it to a friend. Take that first step. Do you do you ever speak to anybody else? Do you ever do you ever have get any therapy? Like, do it. Give yourself. If you're a sore knee, you go to the physiotherapist. If you've got a sore heart or a sore head, 